Thanks for pressing play. I appreciate you investing part of your life with me. This is Christopher Lockhead, Follow Your Different, where we aspire to have real dialogues, not interviews, with amazing people who are making the world a different place. And man, do we ever have that for you today. We're sponsored by the good folks at GrowWire.com. This is the place where entrepreneurs and their businesses learn how to grow. Check it out, GrowWire.com, for stories of innovation. On this episode, uh, I have an incredible conversation with Dr. Dr. Caitlin O'Connell Rodwell. She is one of the world's leading experts on elephants. Yes, elephants. And um, uh, I just find her... And elephants, fascinating. You'll learn that elephants are just like us. Uh, Dr. O'Connell takes us inside the secret lives of elephants and their culture, how elephants and people uh, can live better together. She also explains this incredible um, breakthrough she discovered. She figured out that elephants communicate through the ground. Uh, And she'll walk you through it. And uh, she also thinks that it has some interesting implications for human beings. We talk about how elephants and people develop powerful relationships and why Dr. Caitlin O'Connell Rodwell thinks it's important to stand up for what you believe in. For more information on her incredible background, the takeaways from this key episode, check out, uh, or the key takeaways from this episode, check out Lockhead.com. Now, hey-ho, let's go. They are exactly like we are. Their societies are very similar. They have very similar rituals. They grow up in the same loving but very political family structures, uh, you know, with with dominance hierarchies just like we have, and um, the same rituals. And I think the more that people understand that other animal societies are very similar to our own, I think brings us a little closer to Earth. And um, a little more grounding. When you say they're just like us, I mean, how how would they compare um, intellectually to a human being? Well, you know, we always like to measure intelligence against our own values of intelligence, and you know, there are many animals out there that have different senses. I mean, their sense of smell is so much better than ours. Their sense of hearing is so much better than ours. Um, So they see their world and experience their world much differently than we do. But I would say they have the same value system that we do um, in terms of how they grow up, uh, their uh, emotional intelligence, um, their growth and development socially. And so, um, you know, even if we applied our own human metric of intelligence, we would say that they were equally as intelligent. But if you look at long-term memory, well, if they had a better long-term memory structure, does that mean that they're even more intelligent than us? Um, you know, it, it depends on what our hallmarks of intelligence really are and, and if that's relevant for elephants. Wow. But the answer to your question leads me to a place that says we should, we should view them as equals. That's what I hear you saying. We should, we should should respect that. We should value their presence on this earth just as much as our own presence. And I think that, and that's what's a real challenge here is that the elephant human interface is um, is getting more and more extreme. The more land we use for ourselves, the less land there is for elephants. And uh, we're at a critical juncture, especially for the Asian elephant, where there isn't that much land left, uh, where it's up to us to decide, are we going to allow elephants to exist and, and even aside from the poaching issue, it's a land use issue. We have to sh- be willing to share land. And even within our own species, we have difficulty sharing land and recognizing boundaries. Yeah, not to get political, but there's a debate in the U.S. right now about uh, the U.S.-American border, isn't there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we have that same thing with elephants. Elephants know exactly where it's safe to be and 
when there's hunting season and, and, you know, when to leave an area because it's not a safe time to be in that area. Um, you know, when to sneak across into the cornfields when the corn is ripe and, and, you know, they, they know just like we know when it's the best time to, to raid a resource. So we should equate, um, elephant life with human life. The way we value human life is exactly the same with how we should value uh, elephant life. Yes, and historically, humans have always put themselves above other species. But I think we're at a time in history where we need to reevaluate that um, that paradigm. You know, uh, don't we want? orangutans to exist? Don't we want elephants to exist? Don't we want the rhino to exist? These are critically uh, endangered species in some places and, um, and for the orangutan in all places that it exists. And then it's really because of habitat destruction. And, you know, we have the power to change that. And uh, is there anywhere in the world where it's legal to um, hunt elephants? Yes, there are several places that it is, uh, it is legal. And do you yeah. think that should not be the case? Oh, I thought you said we weren't getting political. <laughs> <laughs> well, you tell me. I mean, if, 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 the, I, the reason I go there is if we should value them the way we value human life then why would we kill them? We're not, we're not yeah, supposed to kill that, each other, right? I mean, we do a lot I think of it, that's but we're not supposed to. Yes, I think that is a very important point. I think um, some conservation structures are, are based on trophy hunting, and I think that that would need to change. Um, you know... <laughs> There are many organizations, conservation organizations, that would like to say there should be no hunting. And I think that that's all well and good if we figure out a system of adopting those elephants instead of hunting them. Um, take each elephant that was on a trophy hunting concession and instead of killing it, adopt it. There, there are other means to an end. Um, and I, I do think that some conservation programs are extremely successful because they have that funding from trophy hunting. And I, I do think that, you know, quotas need to be more strictly policed um, and, and evaluated in terms of what individuals would it be appropriate to remove from a population. You know, I studied um, male elephants for a long time and, and have seen how older members of the population are really critical to the uh, social development of younger males. And to say that those older bulls wandering around by themselves, it's okay to take them out of the society because they don't have any impact. They're no longer um, a, a contributing member of the society. Well, that, that doesn't seem to be the case. And so the more we understand about male society and, uh, how their their social structure is uh, um, laid out in the wild. I, I think we need to be asking ourselves harder questions about what alternative methods for conservation and and generating funds for communities uh, are out there. Yeah. So take me um, take me inside the elephant world tell me about their life and how they grow up and how they interact and bring all that to life for me if you could doctor sure I mean elephants are born into this very social environment um, you know mom is the center of the universe at birth and then she introduces the baby to the immediate family and there's a lot of ritual and excitement around that new birth, uh, then that individual, once they realize what their surroundings I, I are, they... You, but uh, you, there's ritual and excitement. So um, what kind of ritual is there around the birth of a new elephant? 
Well, um, usually the other adult females will surround the birthing mother and protect her. Um, you know, there, there's hyenas kind of waiting in the wings, waiting for the placenta, waiting to see the, if they can grab, snatch the baby. So there's some tension. Um, there's a protective circle around her and a lot of vocalizations, um, uh, kind of jubilant and um, the when I say ritual, there are a lot of um, just like uh, when there is a copulation, there's what's called a post copulatory rumble sequence, and the elephants are very very vocal at that time, but they're also vocal around a um, a birth, and and then. If a, so they're, a they're young, celebrating, they're making happy noises. They're celebrating. Yes, yes. It's, Just like uh, we make happy noises. I know after very, copulation, I make happy noises. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, the whole family joins in those happy noises for elephants anyway. <laughs> um, it's a big party and um, the young males are very vocal and uh, that it, 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 again, it's a, it's a, primal ritual um emotional experience and, and the way i heard you describe the relationships with the children and the mother that goes on for many many years and with the females yes. it goes on for life is that correct that they, they're in relationship with their mothers and, and sometimes grandmothers for much of their life is that right yes i mean if two uh close if two sisters uh, had a calf at the same time or within the same month, those two babies, if they were females, they will be together for life. And that's, you know, 60, 70 years plus. And so when you see those two calves interacting, it's really striking to think that these two individuals are going to be together for life. They're going to grow up together. They're going to have babies together they're going to be protecting their family they're going to be grandmothers together uh it's Seeking really an amazing water and shelter thing. together yes yes everything yes. right making those decisions yeah um i think and so the, the other women live together as a tribe with all of their babies is that am i understanding that right yes all of their female offspring will stay with them for life the males will stay with them until they're about 12 to 15 years of age. And then there's kind of this independence where they want to be independent, but yet they don't want to be independent. So they'll um, space themselves far enough away from the family, but yet they come running back when they feel insecure. And females at that time are trying to push and encourage those young males to leave the family um, you know, they occupy the best resources. They um, stand at the head of the spring and push other females away. They just kind of become a pain in the in the neck. And the females are like you know, most young men do. Of, well, it is. It's very <laughs> similar to young males. You know, it's time to leave the nest and uh, go off and make your own way. And sure, we'll see you occasionally. But, you know, they get fresh with their uh, female members of the family and the young babies, they'll play with them, but they roughhouse with them and the females just say it's time to go. And then I, I've heard you talk about, am I remembering this right, um, Caitlin, that the, the, the young males uh, meet up with other, um, what, are they, what do you call them? Do you call them tribes or um, other Me groups of other groups. Bachelor yeah, groups. bachelor groups. The, men of, the, the, of different the, ages, yes? Yes. The males are very vulnerable at that time because they've grown up in an extremely social environment. And as soon as they have to forge their own ties, go off on their own, it's very scary. I mean, it's um, a vulnerable time for um, lions to potentially attack. Um, it's very lonely. So they try and find older mentors as soon as they can. And, and that means that, that finding individuals that will take them in is sometimes tricky because older males, they don't want to share their resources. Um, you know, that, that's one of the studies that I did was why would an older male share with a younger male? 
and it's partly for company companionship. Um, I know it, it could also be because there's benefits to uh, members of, of uh, related groups to be together. Um, so does that mean like that a that younger can, male from a different family that maybe that group of males is not associated with? Is that, is that what that means? or? Well, one of our preliminary studies shows that males that are more related are more likely to form bonded groups, which makes sense because they grew up together and they sparred together and they played together. It would make sense later in life that they would want to be together. Uh, it was never thought that that was the case, but it does uh, look like, at least in our desert environment, where it could be a different culture, um, I do think that the environment does um, facilitate slightly different cultural pressures. So if there's less food and water, um, it looks to me like the females try and keep the family group smaller than in areas where water is ubiquitous. So that means that there's a lot more pressure uh, on the low ranking females by the high ranking females to, you know, when they're pregnant or just have a baby, they want to, you know, make a decisive cut in the family and say, okay, you guys are off on your own now. And that's sometimes not very easy to watch. And it's very a vulnerable the, time for them. I've heard you talk before about this is there. And it reminds me of our hens that it sounds like there's a very definitive pecking order, so to speak. Yes, it's definitely a definitive pecking order. And so the, now, the matriarch it's, might kick kick one of the lower uh, ones on the pecking order out for uh, various reasons at some point? Yeah, I think the reason is um, there's a theory in ecology called optimal foraging theory where you your group size cannot be any bigger than uh, your fitness. So you don't want to lose fitness by having too many members and not being able to feed them all. So if you keep your group smaller, then you will have better fitness in the long run and fitness in terms of um, reproductive fitness uh, and and the long-term fitness of the whole group. So it, it's Darwin but, working, essentially. Yes. Survival of the fittest means um, putting more pressure on the family so that you make sure that there's uh, a, an optimal number of individuals. Yeah. Now, this does not seem to be the case for um, populations where water and food are more uh, available. So people in like researchers in other places don't see this kind of pressure on low ranking females. So in, in other groups, it's um, there have been studies showing that there's no queen ethos that uh, the next oldest wisest female becomes the matriarch. But in the society that I'm studying in the desert, it doesn't appear to be that way. It appears that the um, matriarch and her closest relatives are the higher ranking individuals, and the low ranking individuals are less related. Now, this is my hypothesis. We're just doing the genetic work right now to see if that's in fact the case. And do you think it might be the difference in the availability of resources changing the behavior? Is that what you're guessing or looking into? Or how do you think about it? Um, well, you know, practically speaking, if you think that you're always following the matriarch and the matriarch's direct um, her sister and her daughter, all of your life, if you're following them, but not a low ranking individual, if that low ranking individual happens to be the next oldest, wisest after the matriarch dies, it's hard to imagine that everyone would suddenly follow her because they haven't been following her or paying attention to her the whole time. And they've been watching their mothers push that individual out so that they don't have the same respect for that individual. Yeah. So it's, it, it does make sense that, that they, it doesn't seem likely that they would become the next leader. So is it, it, it almost sounds like maybe how, you know, we vote for a mayor or a president or how a CEO gets chosen in terms of a, you use the term dominance hierarchy. 
the, the essentially um, the groups so the group the group sort of acknowledges the leadership uh, of the next in line even if it's not um even if she isn't necessarily related to the matriarch who passed is that is that what i'm is that what you're saying that that's what has has been established through genetics and and behavioral observations in in Kenya, where water and um, food resources are more available, but in our situation, in a very desert, stark desert environment where water and food are not available, readily available, it looks as though they're only following the queen, the the matriarch, and the bloodline. That that um, that dominance is bloodline driven. Fascinating. That's what I suspect is happening. Now, earlier you used the term uh, when comparing them to us, they have a similar value system. Can you tell me about what, what you mean by that? Well, it's, it's interesting that um, it's value and also character driven where a matriarch has a particular character that defines the group. You have a very vigilant, wary matriarch, and then you have a, um, very confident matriarch. And, you know, if a baby's in trouble, that confident matriarch immediately goes over, helps and pulls the baby out of the mud, for example. Or if if they're um, very bonded, two individuals would bend down on their knees and pull the individual out. Whereas a very young, inexperienced matriarch might panic, scream, and like, chunk slap everyone else away from her baby that's in trouble because she doesn't know she's very nervous about the situation and wants to just solve the problem herself. So you get this very character driven um, definition of the, uh, of the group. Um, Based on the personality of the leader. Yes. Just like a country is, or a company or any sort of organization sort of takes on a lot of the attributes of its leader in, in human culture. Yes. And that's why that's partly why I say we are so similar to them. And, and males are the same way. You have these really aggressive brutes and other males don't want to follow them because they're too aggressive. But the great leaders are the ones that have an equal balance between carrot and stick. You know, they're, they're respected because they're tough, but they're also soft. And, and you can see that. You can see, you can see them respond more to a leader who's tough but fair as opposed to just a tough tyrant, so to speak. Yes. No one's interested in following a tyrant. <laughs> wow. It's really fascinating. Uh, when one of our dominant bulls uh, disappeared a few years ago. We had these kind of rise and fall of of bullies that became more diplomatic in order to try and gather up his own posse and then just fail because he wasn't able to keep those individuals under his wing. And, and we still haven't gotten a new um, dominant bull, which makes me even more realize how amazing uh, Greg, who was our dominant bull at the time, how, how amazing he was at, at keeping the group together. And, you know, and even uh, to the did, point. What happened to Greg? I, I don't know. I think that he, he got wounded and uh, it could have been a fight or it could have been a snare. I hope not. But his trunk, uh, had a hole in it one season he came and he was very weak and didn't want to be around any of his uh, contemporaries. He was very grumpy. He only allowed very small males to follow him and they would wait for him. Um, it took him a really long time to drink because he had this hole in his trunk. And so these young bulls would, would kind of protect or, or keep him company. And then, so I thought, he might not survive, but the next year he came back and he was fully recovered back at the top of the hierarchy. And then he disappeared the next year. Uh, and, and that was the year we did a Smithsonian documentary uh, planning to, to show this great um, high ranking bull and he didn't show up. So what we had to tell the story was, 
when you pull the kingpin out of the system, what happens? Yeah. And there was a scramble for power and bullies became less aggressive. Uh, and you know, the softies did not have any interest. They were not politically motivated. They, the beloved softies did not become, um, dominant. So it's, and so there it's, was just a vacuum at the top. Yeah. And there still is. It, there and sometimes is. in, in some primate, uh, groups, it takes a long time to get another individual that is interested, politically motivated, and could hold that position. And um, this may seem like a silly question, but uh, how are they emotionally? Do, they, do you see them experiencing emotions, communicating emotions, acting in emotional yes. ways? You know, it's funny because the young males are the most emotional. <laughs> the 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 ones Isn't that, that are true in our, well, our young females in our world too. But <laughs> okay, it's true. But the males, they're very vocal and uh, kind of wear their heart on their sleeve. They, um, they kind of when the family goes off and they're still playing with some. Uh, bulls from another family and they think, oh, I don't care. I don't need to, you know, follow our family, my family out. But once they get uh, enough distance and they realize that they're too far away, they go screaming and trumpeting and running, running, running after the family. And you can always tell when a young bull has put too much distance, even if they're way in the bush, you hear them screaming and trumpeting. <laughs> um, so they, they are very emotional kind of um, emotionally volatile at that time, which is very similar to teenage boys um, in, you know, finding new friendships. Uh, whereas the females there, it's almost when they have their greeting ceremonies, it's this combination of uh, uh, a physiological response even including urinating and defecating as they rumble and they place their trunk on the ground and they flap their ears. And it's, it's this physiological and emotional response. Whereas when males greet each other, it's much more relaxed. It's more like the back slapping you see in a bar setting uh, and then kind of rough and tumble greeting and trunk wraps and, trunks in the mouth and it's very fluid and their bodies are very loose. Whereas the females are very stiff. They are so excited to see each other, but yet it's so regimented. The greeting is not like the difference to, do you, do you have a sense? I, I don't, all I can think of is that there's, I mean, they both are very hormonally driven and hormonally influenced by each other but there's been more documented on the influence of, of testosterone and testosterone suppression on younger males. But with females, um, you know, as much as it's, it's uh, published that they're not synchronized, uh, they do have synchronous births. So I do think there's a lot of hormonal um, and maybe even hormonal suppression between the more dominant individuals and less dominant. And that's very prevalent in the primate what you, what, world. What, what do you mean? That the, the less dominant females w- would be less likely to bear children than the more dominant? Ones? Yes. I suspect that we have not proven it and it will take a lot to prove it. But when I see the young low ranking females being pushed pressured out of the family, there's a lot of pressure on them when they're pregnant and just after birth. It's like they don't want that baby to be bonded to the family because it would be much harder to get rid of them. And you see that very, um, very strategically. So the family the shuns older. them as a result. Yes. Because I don't, I don't want you to have a baby. I don't want your baby to get connected to the family. Yeah, and I've seen when they do connect to the family, it's much more difficult to extricate them. And I've also seen where the high-ranking females don't let the low-ranking calves play with the high-ranking calves. They will chase them away from the high-ranking calves. So you mean the the kids (laughs) in the private school don't talk to the kids in the hood? 
Yeah, and it's not doesn't appear to be that the the kids in the private school themselves are shunning the kids from the hood. It's the parents uh-huh. don't want them to interact. That's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Uh and this is not something that people see in in other environments and that's why I think it's just like humans that the environment dictates some of our culture and our behaviors. And uh, when they fight, will they fight each other to the death or what happens when they fight? Well, the males certainly can fight to the death. They, they square up and as soon as they uh, get off of that square alignment, that tusk can go straight into the ribs and um, deliver a, a, a killing blow. So it's a very, when you see a combat situation between two males or particularly two must males who are very, very aggressive, it's, um, it's a formidable sight. I mean, the, the so, females so, don't have combat in the same way. Um, they're much more um, push the others out. Um, you know, they, they, dominate the high rank, uh, sorry, they'll, they'll um, preoccupy or occupy the areas that have better resources. And that's been shown through satellite tracking and knowing dominant families, they have better fitness because they are able to access the better resources. And then they push other families off the water hole. If the timing isn't right and the high ranking family is there, they will not let the low ranking family drink from the preferred source or even in um, the, the brackish pan. By, by inflicting they, physical harm on them, if required. Um, it usually doesn't come down to physical harm by the females. They usually are able to intimidate them physically by chasing them or even a head shake or um, they'll, they can form a line of five high ranking individuals and march across and, and form a phalanx kind of and, and intimidate the other group. So they back off and wait and they don't want to be injured. Obviously it's a uh, life threatening to, to get tusked and, and, and injured. So they would rather avoid that. Yeah. But, but the men will fight full on. They will. Yes. And so a dominant um, male like Greg, for him to have been dominant for so long, does that by definition mean that he would have been in several life-threatening uh, fights over his life? Yes. And and what's interesting there, especially in our environment, the um, the minerals in the soil are deficient such that the tusks are brittle. And a lot of the high-ranking males that have fought a lot have very small tusks because they keep getting broken, but yet they still maintain their position at the top. So that has to tell you that character is actually more important than your um, weapons of war. Wow, so they get <laughs> uh, that, respected that, for their behavior, not just their yes. their prowess in, in fighting. Yes. And, and often you'll see the gentle giants are the ones that have big tusks because they're not fighting. And is there ever a situation where if, if, a, if, if a, somebody who's threatening the leader, will any of the other males come to his defense or is it always a one-on-one kind of a battle or, or is it a mix? Well, no, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, with Greg, he's, he's actually has his muscle and he's got other uh, backup support that he even sometimes will not engage in the fight. He has his his muscle go out and have the fight for him. See, and we've that's seen like that. a hockey team, right? A hockey team has an enforcer. <laughs> yes. And what ends up happening is if two of the stars on the hockey team start m- mixing it up, often they'll go to the bench and either team will send their enforcer and the enforcers will fight it out and the guys who are tussling it up in the beginning don't fight. So elephants do the yes. same thing. Yes, they do. It's it's really fascinating to see this. And then there'll be um, diplomats who don't like these bullies and they want to uh, intimidate them to not be part of the group. So they will try and be peacemakers, but it's more difficult for them because they're not fighters. So they're constantly you know, disgruntled about these bullies. But 
but more dramatic is when Greg wants somebody out, his whole group will form a line of intimidation. And it's usually not him that has to uh, do the dirty work. He has the second in command that goes out there and does it for him. Wow. So fascinating. <laughs> and then I, I wonder, and um, I, I got to ask you just because I'm such a huge fan of, of our chickens and I've fallen in love with them. We have at least <laughs> one hen for sure who I, my wife and I are positive. There's no way she makes it in, in, in the real world, so to speak, that she is, her name, her name is Penelope. We call her poo poo for short. And sometimes we call her whack a poo <laughs> and that in, 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 in a real chicken environment, she wouldn't survive. And, you know, she survives cause we take care of her and we make sure the other ones aren't, you know, overly mean to her and so forth and so on. And so is that the same with some of these, um, maybe some of these females that get shunned, that uh, they they sort of do they end up in captivity or are there human beings who protect them in some kind of a preserve or like do do you have a wackapoo <laughs> somewhere? In there? Well, no. What happens? Um, you know, I've been following three of these uh, low ranking females from three different families, and one of them has now become a matriarch of her own family, and and that's what I think happens over time is that these. Uh, low-ranking females, once they build up enough of their own um, daughters and daughters of daughters, that they are the matriarch of a new family. And they grow into the role. Wow. Yeah, and they do grow into that role, yeah. and So maybe Wackapoo might make it on her own after all if we weren't babying her. (laughs) Possibly, (laughs) but possibly not. (laughs) You know, even in captivity, I've seen... You know, this this um, pecking order in elephants is just the same. Um, you'll have a, a dominant individual who's constantly harassing a low-ranking individual. And, and you think, oh, my gosh, this is so terrible. You know, it's, it's because they're in captivity. But it's not. It's the same thing in the wild. They can't go off on their own. They can't survive on their own. They need that group to protect their babies. So they have mm-hmm. to put up with this harassment until there's some way that they can succeed and, and it's safe to be on their own. So in the case of Winona is one of our longstanding low ranking females who is now officially her own matriarch of, of her own family. But there are others where they had a different solution. One of them was so shunned. I thought her baby was going to die. She was so stressed and wasn't lactating anymore. And the baby got weaker and weaker, but for whatever reason, another female from the family decided to join her and her calf. And so now they're their own uh, separate wow. family. So a lot like humans so, where, you know, sometimes we drift apart and we create our own tribes or we create our own families and some families, unfortunately, break apart and people. Cre- it sounds very similar. It is. And, and, and more poignantly, so in in um, environments where there's been a lot of poaching, and uh, the, where the matriarch is, uh, has been taken out, and then you see how the family reconstructs itself uh, without those leaders. And then in some areas, you have a lot of orphans that have to kind of restructure themselves. That's happened. There's a uh, study in Kenya, I uh, know, Tanzania, uh, looking at how families reorganize without, when they've lost their, their leaders. Wow. Uh, and then they do it. And sometimes it's very difficult because families don't actually want to take in outsiders. Uh, you know, and so it's kind of that Darwinian evolution, um, survival of the fittest. If you start helping someone who's not genetically closely related, then you're sharing resources that could go towards your family. And so it's, it's understandable, um, but also heartbreaking to see. Yeah. Now, I'm curious to ask you, what is your position? What are your thoughts about whether it's a circus or a zoo or, you know, these wonderful animals living in captivity and doing these things? Well, one of the problems with elephants in entertainment is that the show must go on. And, you know, if I'm, you know, a trapeze artist and I don't feel well, I can actually verbalize that and take a day off but an elephant can't 
and they get beaten into submission and forced to perform. And we've seen a number of situations where they uh, reject that attack. They're, um, they're uh, a trainer, which often sometimes is a good relationship and often it's a bad relationship and they'll go and take out their, uh, they'll vent their anger on all yeah. of the personal property of that trainer. I mean, that's been a, just amazing stories yeah, I mean, about we've all, that. We've all turned on the news one day and seen how some elephant at some show somewhere just said enough's enough F you guys and went mental. Yeah. And you can understand it. All the years of abuse and there's unfortunately not good stories of, of, of that. And it's kind of amazing that we've now seen our last, you know, um, does it, uh, I think it's Ringling Barman. Brothers. Ringling Brothers. R- yeah. Ring, Ringling Brothers have, have finally um, decided not to use elephants anymore. And and, and what do you think um, about zoos? You know, in sort of our major cities and stuff. I mean, there's an argument that some people that make that say, well, yes, they're in captivity, but because people get to see them, and you know, maybe that ultimately means good things that people get endeared towards, whether it's elephants or or any of these other sort of more exotic animals that you know we don't have rolling around. In, in California. Yeah. Or, so do you think that's, a, you know, is a zoo a good thing for an elephant or a bad thing? Or what, what do you think? Well, it depends. I, I think zoos have gone through an amazing transformation. And for those zoos who have the resources uh, to have enough land and uh, enough of a budget to support quality um, uh, quality environment and food and enrichment for elephants, there are there are some places that that are great places for people to be able to see elephants and and you know look at those elephants and as an ambassador for the wild and and really ignite people's interest in conservation and those zoos are doing a lot of work in the wild to support conservation and so I think it really depends I, I think when um, you know there's been a lot of cases now of, of Chinese zoos getting um, approval to have elephants caught in the wild and shipped there. And, you know, I've, I've seen terrible environments for elephants that, that I, I do think there has to be some international commission for captive elephants where only certain places should be um, uh, deemed appropriate for these uh to be able to house these elephants because there's so many places that are inappropriate um, for elephants. And I think some of the the sanctuaries have been wonderful places to, you know, what do you do with an elephant that lives for up to 90 years in captivity? What what do you do with them when, when, you know, at 50 they've spent their whole lives in captivity, whether it's been entertaining or, or rides or, or whatever, uh, these um, sanctuaries that are that are supporting them have been a really great thing for elephants as well because you can't just turn an elephant back to the wild that has never been in the wild. They've grown up in captivity and they don't know how to survive in the wild. You know, I'm so glad to hear you say that. I, I, I expected maybe you'd have more of a universal negative, but it, it sounds like it's not a universal negative. Yes, there are some big negatives. Yes, it sounds like you want some more governance and control. But it sounds like there are some zoos that are doing some good things and treat these animals well and give them a good life. There are. I mean, you know, ultimately, in an ideal world, I would say that migratory species, uh, marine mammals, elephants, gray apes, I'd prefer not to see them in captivity. Uh, But if they are in captivity and there are certain places where the environments are appropriate for those animals. And and many of them, again, there's been a transformation that there are places that are doing really good things for these animals. And and having those animals serve as important ambassadors for uh, people that will never get to see a wild um, animal. So that that leads me to another area of curiosity, and this may sound like a funny term, but Um, the, you know, the relationship between humans and elephants, I think many of us can relate to loving a dog or loving a cat. 
And if you'd ever said to me, I would love chickens, I never would have believed it. But I, you know, I don't care how crazy it makes me sound. I love our little girls. And, and as crazy as this makes me sound, they love me back. I mean, it's very I clear. I believe it. I could tell you I mean, when, when Beatrice sits there at the end of the walkway and squats down screaming for me to pick her up, it's very clear what's <laughs> going on. And when I pick her up, she makes a very happy sound and it's cuddle time and that's what we're doing. And it's like, so this, it's a weird phrase, interspecies love, but it's an incredibly powerful thing. And I think many of us who've had a pet have experienced it. And I, you know, I've never been a horse owner, but I've talked to people who with horses and so forth. And so I'm curious about, the relationships you have and the relationships other people have. And do you guys fall in love with each other? And kind of, could you tell me about that part of it? Oh, well, I mean, elephants have amazing relationships with, with people. And because I study wild elephants, I, I'm not privy to that. And I wish I had that, but I feel like as a scientist, I have to keep a certain distance where I'm studying their society and not inserting myself into it. But I've had the privilege in captivity to experience how amazing elephants are at, at relationships and how bonded they are with, with their trainers in, in good situations because there are bad trainers and bad situations. But the ones that are good are just so heartwarming and they're very similar to a relationship with a dog where there's loyal, um, extremely bonded um, relationships that, uh, and again, they, they speak English, you know, <laughs> you ask them to do certain things. I work with the elephants at the Oakland Zoo and we've trained one elephant to respond to different target training regimes. And uh, it's it's really striking how much English she speaks, uh, not speaks, but understands and responds to. And, uh, you know, you talk about inter species love, whether it's a chicken or uh, so many animals are capable of having the, the, the kinds of bonds that we only expect between ourselves or ourselves and a domestic animal like a dog. They, they react like I think they might, like I think about, you know, we have two kitty cats and then we have the hens. And when you talk to them in a happy sort of loving voice, you call them, you call their names, maybe you have treats for them. They come running. They're happy to oh, see yes. you. <laughs> or, or, or when you yell at them with a dad voice because they're doing something wrong, they know exactly what's up and they stop oh, doing it. Yeah. So do, do those sorts yeah. of things happen? Definitely. I mean, their posture, their body language says it all. If, uh, if Donna, the elephant at the Oakland Zoo, is doing well at her, uh, it's like a game. She has to choose between one um, picture or another picture. And when she's doing well, she puffs up and she holds her shoulders high and she starts kind of rumbling and getting all happy. And then when she keeps failing at the experiment, she holds her shoulders low, she holds her head down, and she just feels so the straw and when is this torture going to end? I'm so confused. I don't know what you want. But then when she's doing well, she's like, yay, I want to talk of the world. Give me more treats. <laughs> so it it's sounds like really me when fun. I'm surfing, when I'm catching waves and I'm doing great, I'm a happy guy. And when I'm not getting any waves, yeah. I'm falling or I'm blowing the takeoffs, I'm miserable and I go home all pissed off. Same thing. It's the worst. <laughs> 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 now, I also have to ask you, oh, did you have one more? You want to share more there? Or? I was going to say how similar that is to being with a dog and training a dog on certain um, things. They get very proud and excited and, and want to please you and really enjoy the, the challenge. Um, so I think enrichment in captive environments is really important that they have these challenges because they, they want to succeed and they it's you know we think of that as a very human thing but i think a lot of people that have worked with dogs or horses um, understand that reward system and how enriching and important that is for them psychologically to yeah. feel that success yeah it's look this may sound crazy but you know when the hens make their eggs they crow they want you to know and uh, we have one of our hens, Beatrice, she's prone to making really shitty eggs, ill-formed, and sometimes they get all over her and stuff. And so when she makes a shitty egg, she's upset. 
and she's out, like she's inconsolable, right? And you got to clean her up, and she's got like it takes her an hour to get over the fact that she made this messy, shitty egg. It, you know, so it's so fascinating. <laughs> now, I have to ask you about communication. If I understand correctly, you are the person who discovered that elephants communicate in multiple ways, and maybe most interesting, but you'll tell me, hopefully, they communicate through the ground. And they listen through their feet and their trunks. Am I, did I get this right? Yes, yes. So first, um, if you could, how did you make this discovery? This sounds like an incredible thing. And of course, elephants have been studied for many decades, but it took you to fi- figure this out. So I'm, I'm fascinated for you to unpack this, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> well, I think it's uh, just a case of um, coming in with a very different perspective. Um, it had been known for some time that elephants vocalized with a very low frequency call made in in the range of 20 hertz and with a high um, sound pressure level signal. So it's 120 decibels. So it's like a mini explosion as an elephant vocalizes at, at 20 hertz. But while they do that, that vocalization is made with such energy that it creates a ripple across the surface of the earth. So you have to think of the earth as an elastic medium and like tossing a stone into water. When you inject that energy, it creates a ripple. And that ripple is, is actually the same signal as the vocalization. And for me, wow. I Can came I slow you from, down there for a sec, doctor? I'm sorry. So yeah, yeah. what they're doing is creating, and if this is the wrong way, then you, you tell me how to think about it, but really a, a, a micro mini earthquake of sorts. Yes. And they're doing that because they made a really giant noise, but at a frequency level that you and I can't hear. Yeah. And then this, at the, I want to make sure I heard you right, because I, 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 I didn't get this in some of the stuff I researched on, about you. So the frequency is exactly the same in a vocalization that is in the air, so to speak, as it is in the ground. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, and not just the frequency, the actual um, encoding the temporal um, pattern so that you can interpret it the same way. So, so the I words stuck, they're using, so to speak, if I could call yeah, them that, are the, it's same, the same, whether they're sending those words on, in the ground or in the air. Yes, and wow. both happen as the elephant vocalizes, that same vocalization is propagated in the ground and it's like putting a gramophone stylus in the ground. We, we hear the record playing, but if you put that stylus in the ground, you could hear the elephant vocalization. It would sound exactly the same as it does in the air, but it's vibrations in a substrate versus vibrations in the air. But to the receiving elephant, it's, ex- it's, it, it's quote it's unquote the sounds the same way, and it's the same words, so to speak, that they're receiving. It's the same communication. Yes. And yes. then I've heard you talk about how they move differently with their feet because are they using their toes or how do they use their feet in their trunks to listen? Well, um, elephants and, and humans have two different pathways to detect vibrations. One is through um, vibration sensitive cells that all mammals have in their feet, their hands. Uh, for the elephant trunk, we have them in our lips as well. The elephant can feel those um, vibrations. And if you imagine these cells, these vibration sensitive cells are like an onion. And when the onion shifts, those different uh, layers of the onion send a nerve impulse to the brain. So that's one pathway. The other pathway is through what's called bone conduction. If you stand very still, like an elephant would stand still, and you feel a vibration, or if you're sitting on a a speaker that's playing loud music, but it's transferring it into the ground, your ear bones will shake just as if you receive sound through your eardrum into the ear uh, into the middle ear and and that same signal because your ear bones are going to shake the same way that same signal gets into your cochlea and, and goes to your brain as if you heard that sound rather so than it, felt it so 
and this may make me sound really stupid, but that's a risk I take a lot. So when I'm at the <laughs> Foo Fighters concert and there's 150,000 people there, I'm yeah. because the ground is actually shaking a little because it's so loud. Um, am I actually hearing part of the music through my bones? Is that did I hear that? Yes. Right, or am I got, not getting this right? Well, you are, but there's so much in the air as well. So it's, it's a better example to think of a person with hearing impairments standing on a wooden floor with a big speaker and they're hearing the Foo Fighters through the vibrations rather than uh, through the air into their God. ear. Fast. So, it's, so people with hearing impairments are much more sensitive to vibrations than we are because we're We've tuned them out. We've got so many other uh, sensory inputs. But for people with hearing impairments, their auditory cortex is not getting uh, signals from the airborne environment. So they're actually processing vibrations instead. So the, basically the somatosensory cortex is much larger, um, has more real estate for processing vibrations for a hearing impaired person versus a person who can hear normally. Now, do they do this uh, uh, to be able to communicate over longer distances or, or is there just different communications that they, like, why, why do they communicate in these multiple fashions? Well, one way to look at it, the simplest way to look at it is that it's a byproduct of having such a loud vocalization. And because of that, you have two channels to detect the signal. You've got the airborne environment and the ground. And there are physical properties of detecting a, a um, signal on the ground. One is that it would travel at a separate rate than the airborne signal so that you could effectively like counting the distance between lightning and thunder and figure out how far away the signaler was. Um, there's other physical advantages if the sound is traveling slower at a slower velocity in the ground you'd have a better way of localizing that sound because of the... So I, I just want to go back to the first one. I'm, I'm sorry. The first one is I will have a better sense of where the other elephant is who's communicating to me physically is if the communication comes to the ground. Is that what you said uh, or did I misunderstand that? Yeah, that's the second one. So the that's, first one is you'd be able to tell how far away it was. Because there'll be a difference in velocity so in the airborne environment versus yeah, distance and location. And the location is because that signal is going to be either longer or shorter depending on the velocity. And for an elephant call, their signal is um, 20 hertz, which calcul translates into a 17-meter wave. And that 17-meter a signal is very, very different to localize because it's so flat. But if it's if it's um, uh, twelve meters versus seventeen meters, because let's say the sound in the ground at our field site travels at one hundred and fifty meters per second versus an airborne sound that travels at three hundred and forty four meters per second, it means that your signal on the ground is shorter, which means you're going to have a higher um, a stronger phase angle for the elephant to then shift around and figure out where that sound is coming from. So there's, there's a lot of physical advantages to having these two different channels of communication. And I, I heard you, I forget which talk it was. Maybe it was one of your Ted talks um, or maybe it was something you wrote, but I, I remember um, you talking about that, this breakthrough in understanding how they communicate has now had practical applications for helping you to help human beings and elephants live together uh, more effectively, if I maybe could put it that way. So could you unpack that? I, I, I found that whole thread very fascinating. Well, yeah. And after studying their vibrations and realizing that um, they have vocalizations in the ground. There are footfalls we can measure in the ground. There are a number of conservation applications for this knowledge. And one is simply that we could measure 
know remotely when an elephant is in an area. So we could alert farmers to the fact that elephants are just crossing over into your area. And if you have an early warning system, you're able to defend your crop easier to get them out before they actually are standing in your cornfield eating your corn. It's much harder to get them out. Um, so that's one it's example. It's hard to get me away from the buffet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, that's one example. Another is um, setting up these uh, sensors to detect where humans shouldn't be in certain places. So poaching, um, also, uh, uh, what were we talking about before? Oh, understanding how sophisticated these uh, uh, elephants are able to detect differences in vocalizations got me thinking about why we're not using that in our own lives for hearing impaired people and, and using a vibrotactile um, aid for them where we can tell very fine frequency uh, discrimination differences in our hands and feet and even across our back. And so studying this in elephants got me thinking a lot more about how we might help ourselves wow. and um, develop better hearing aid technologies. And, and am I remembering this part right as well in the context of, of uh, keeping them out of the cornfield that you were able to identify the specific sounds that females, is it in heat? Is that what you call it for an elephant when she's ready? An estrus, yeah. Yeah. An estrus call. An estrus call saying, hey, hey boys, I'm ready. And you were able to do that to move uh, sort of a group of bulls away from fo- uh, farm areas. Is that, am I remembering this correctly? Yes. So um, male elephants are, uh, have a similar hormonal state like uh, antelope that go into rut. Um, But the difference with elephants is that they go into this hormonal state serially, not at the same time. So it's kind of like a turn taking. Um, This male will be in must and one of them's ready. And then one of them's ready in a few weeks. And it's not like spring where everybody's ready. Yeah. And it, and it, you know, it could be considered gentlemanly, but really it's the more dominant individuals uh, can maintain this state longer and they tend to maintain the state when there's more females than estrus. So there's definitely a hierarchy that goes on. But for males that are in must, one, the females prefer males that are in must because they can, my thought is that they can effectively get rid of all those other males and not hassle the females. But also when they're in must, it shows that they are physically fit and can maintain this heightened state of testosterone for longer. And so the females, that's a a measure of uh, this is a a good mate to have. Um, So what happens, the males are also attracted to the females when they are in estrus. They have a specific call that says they're, they're announcing themselves. And when we play that call back to males, this is like putting yourself on Tinder. Yeah. Saying, Hey, I'm looking. Yeah. And then you can write and left swipe accordingly. Accordingly. Well, these, (laughs) these males that are in must are very interested in the estrus call, but males that are not in must are not so interested in the estrus calls unless they're young males. So like I said, in these, situations where you have these big family reunions and the, if a females and estrus is a lot of excitement and these young males it's just like a party and they like to be around these uh, estrus females um, because there's a lot of excitement and so when you play back the estrus calls you'll get young males and then you'll get males adult males that are in must so what we've developed and have shown to the ministry that we've been working with is that if you play these calls back, the must bulls will come directly to the speaker. And that, that helps because these males are searching far and wide for an estrus female. An estrus female, they only go into estrus every four to 60 years. They, you know, their gestation is 22 months and then they are nursing for another two years. So it's a rare event. And so when males are searching these for these guys. females, they, this sounds terrible. Yeah, they're traveling long distances searching for them. And what happens is they usually break through the park boundary and then they're out in the human areas 
they're in must, they're dangerous, and people don't want them out there. And so they'll call up the ministry to complain about this. And all the ministry can do really is take a helicopter at great expense and try and force fly over that must bowl and try and force it back into the park, which is very uh, risky and and dangerous for the elephant because they could break a tusk, they could hurt themselves by having to break back through the fence. It's very traumatic. So we propose that they take these broadcast speakers and play them at an opening in the fence that they want the elephants to come through and invite those bulls back into the park. So we've been able to use uh, elephant vocalizations, um, seismic communication in a way that uh, has great conservation applications. I just love how this experience you had of watching them walk and then connecting all these dots that nobody else ever connected is a fascinating discovery in of itself. But then to your point, you know, a conservation application, breaking ideas, breaking open ideas for, for uh, humans with uh, hearing deficits and, 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 and potentially others over time. I don't know, but it's, it's, it's fascinating. Now, I also have well, to ask a, you, so go, go ahead. No, it's a, it's a privilege to be able to, to spend time with elephants in the wild and, and really try and figure out what's going on in their heads. <laughs> yeah. And so that maybe that leads me to kind of, um, you know, where maybe we can land, which is um, how do I, how did you become you? I mean, this is, you are a classic from a career perspective, what I would call a niche down. I mean, you occupy a very tight uh, research niche. There aren't too many of you in the world, I would imagine. Yes, that's true. And so how did you get to be you? <laughs> well, um, I think, you know, it took 10 years to prove that elephants uh, are able to detect seismic um, the seismic components of their vocalizations and, and the applications for it. So I, I think scientists that stick to their guns and are very persistent and don't take no for an answer and just keep going and going and going. Um, and it takes a lot of confidence and um, never taking no for an answer. I think that's, that's um, part of it. Uh, for sure. And how do you, uh, to have the, how do you persevere in those moments of doubt that, you know, we all have, even if you are convinced you've got this discovery, but if the world is doubting you, how do you, how do you continue forward? Well, you know, there's definitely cultures, you know, scientists are human and we have our biases, um, our cultural biases and the, experience that we grew up in in a scientific community and if if you've not been exposed to a certain idea or if there isn't a preponderance of or, or um, previous evidence you know just like our litigious um, structures if you, if you don't have a precedent then how do you publish a paper without referencing previous work and it's very difficult to establish that and it takes it takes courage on editors' um, parts. It takes um, courage for mentors to recognize that something different is going on that they hadn't seen before. Uh, and, and so it takes a lot of different perspectives to, to accept a new paradigm. Well, I, I, I love that you push through all of that. I don't know the world that you live in, but... Um you you discovered something that i mean how many years have humans been studying elephants <laughs> well a long time but again i came um from a fresh perspective and i think that's encouraging for the next generation of scientists that with a fresh different perspective you shouldn't be intimidated that everything's all been figured out and i uh, had I had studied seismic communication and in insects prior to studying elephants. And I saw that elephants were behaving exactly like those tiny little millimeter plant hoppers um, on the plants that I was studying in Hawaii <laughs> and went to Africa and realized that elephants were doing exactly the same thing, searching 
freezing, pressing uh, their front feet uh, forward and and always before the arrival of another group of elephants. And this is exactly what the insects were doing that I was studying. And so that fresh perspective really broke the boundaries into another area for for elephant research. I, I, I love that you connected a dot from studying insects in Hawaii to elephants and how they communicate. I mean, it's just, it's a very, very (laughs) cool story. Is there anything else you'd like to touch on before we wrap? Um, I don't know. I think we've covered uh, one area that I've spent a lot of time on after all of the scientific papers was Realizing that scientists are not very good at communicating to the public and having to learn um, how to be a better communicator. And I think that's an important responsibility for scientists. And I enjoyed that challenge of writing science memoirs. Uh, I didn't expect to write about myself. I wanted to write fiction about elephants to help people understand the the problems that people live with um, who live around elephants, you know, it's kind of like farmers, uh, sheep farmers, not wanting wolves in their backyard. I wanted to convey that idea about how, what it's like for people living with elephants in their backyard. And that launched me into a whole, uh, becoming an author. And, and I really enjoyed that journey being a scientist and learning how to, uh, create a compelling narrative out of science and, and that's another avenue that I've really enjoyed. And I, well, I hope have to that I've gotten more people interested in science. <laughs> I, 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 th- there's no doubt because you got me interested. I can't remember exactly where I saw you. I, I might have been, was it, was it on like CBS 60 Minutes or, or one of those kinds of, or a Sunday oh, morning? Oh, maybe CBS or, Sunday morning, yeah. That might have been where I saw you. And I just I was like, holy cow, sitting there watching it with my, with my wife, Carrie, and that's incredible stuff that she was just talking about and then Googling you and then your Ted talks. And I was like, wow, I wonder if we could get her on the show. It's just, it's really fascinating. And so I think it's wonderful that you've taken it upon yourself to become a communicator. You're the stuff that you've put out in the world. You're what today we refer to as digital body of work is easy for layman's to consume and at least for me to get fascinated in. So I, I, I appreciate not only the work, but that you've taken it so seriously to communicate to layman's like me, because I am more interested in, in elephants as a result of, uh, of Caitlin. <laughs> well, well, that's wonderful. That's and great. I, I, well, I also have I to tell you, you tracking me down. <laughs> well, you're, you're welcome. And I also have to tell you, it makes me happy that you and your colleagues who do things like you do are in the world. It's not a world I know. It's not a world I ever was in, but it makes me happy to know that uh, Dr. Caitlin is researching how elephants communicate and how we can live together better with them and et cetera, et cetera. It's very cool. Well, thanks. I, I appreciate you wanting to cover the topic in your uh, your program. And, and thanks so much for, for having me. The pleasure has been all mine. Thank you so much, doctor. Whew. Do you know somebody who would love this episode? I mean, frankly, who wouldn't love this episode? Uh, well, I'd love you just a little bit extra if you shared it with them right now. And uh, make no mistake, we deeply appre- appreciate your shares on social media. And uh, we deeply appreciate your, um, your ratings and reviews of this podcast. Now, do you want to grow yourself and your business? Check out growwire.com, stories of innovation and growth. Um, this is the new place on the internet. Um, f- there's a podcast, which is fantastic. There's a YouTube show called The Grow, Sh- Grow Show. There's legendary content. As a matter of fact, recently I was on uh, growwire.com and I read uh, one of my favorite things that I've read in a long time. It's about a nonprofit called Compassion in World Farming, C-I-W-F. And they are a nonprofit that believes that animals deserve to be tr- treated with compassion and respect. It's an incredible piece by uh, my friend Kendall Fisher. You can check that out and a lot of other cool things on growwire.com. It's what legendary entrepreneurs read. Bookmark it today. 
And uh, if you have any questions that you want me to answer on an upcoming episode, uh, feel free to send email to blackhole at lockhead, L-O-C-H-H-E-A-D dot com. We have a brand new website, lockhead.com. And you can uh, follow me on Twitter if you like, at lockhead. All right. We would like to thank the number one bestseller, Niche Down from uh, Heather Clancy and myself, How to Become Legendary by Being Different. Uh, the good people at OneLifeFullyLived.org learn how to dream, plan, and live your best life for as close to free as we can make it. OneLifeFullyLived.org. The best-selling book from my friend and multi-time guest, Dushka Zapata, Someone Destroyed My Rocket Ship and Other Havoc I Have Witnessed in the Office. <laughs> She really does have the greatest uh, the greatest titles. Dushka Zapata, check her out on Amazon.com. Now, are you feeling whelmed? Overly, that is? Is it time for you to get some help? Have you ever thought about a virtual assistant? This is a new category. And leading this new category are my friends at Bottleneck Virtual Assistants. Check them out at Bottleneck, all one word, dot online. This is where you can get help and uh, extend your reach uh, for a uh, very cost-effective price. Now, are you a thought leader? Are you trying to get your thoughts on leading podcasts? Check out my friends at interviewvalet.com, podcast interview marketing. And uh, hey, are you in Ireland? It turns out we have a growing audience in Ireland. Who would have thought it? And uh, there's some marketing leaders over there I've fallen in love with. Check out the good people at fusion.ie, F-U-Z-I-O-N dot I-E. Legendary PR, marketing, and design in the amazing country of Ireland. And the incredible people at the Front Row Foundation, making moments that matter for people with life-threatening diseases. If you want to make a difference, this is a, a wonderful place to do it. Check out the Front Row Foundation dot O-R-G. All right, I need to remind you that today's information is provided to you solely for informational purposes. And this oddcast is the sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network. Uh, we must remind you that the information in this oddcast should not be taken without the express written consent of somebody who knows what they're doing. <laughs> I also must warn you that the information in this oddcast um, and the creators of this oddcast uh, may have created this content uh, in a, um, a while consuming libations and is a slightly altered state. So uh, act accordingly. Be nice to elephants. Don't forget to buy John's crazy socks. Tell two people you love about two podcasts you love. Don't be lame. Get out of the passing lane. Uh, remember to listen to Joan Jett. Only buy pasture raised, free range eggs. Thank you, Candy Dandy. I love you, Mum and Dad. And hey, Colin, this odd cast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go to Christine Comerford. Sorry, Christine, we just ran out of time for you. That's it, my friends. Thank you so much for investing part of your life with me. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon on another episode of Christopher Lockhead, Follow Your Different.